Good afternoon. This is Quillian's Colonels at Taylor English Duma. I'm here with my colleagues at Taylor English to discuss many things that can happen in the course of planning and taking depositions. Uh, prior to this session, we have led up to subpoenaing witnesses, the breadth of the subpoenas, technical rules relating to how do you get a witness to the table, and now we're going to talk a little bit more about that and then go into actual deposition planning and taking. As I want to remind everybody out there in the world, we are not providing legal advice here at Taylor English. This is a seminar on practical aspects of litigation. Please consult your own attorney uh, and read your rules yourself regarding uh, the topics of discussion. This is to help you not to solve all your problems or to uh, give you legal advice. Uh, as we discussed last time around, we got the witnesses they were in the, within the general geographic region of the law offices uh, where the deposition would be taken uh, to the table by means of subpoenas issued. Uh, the one thing we did not mention is the service of the witness fee with the deposition subpoena. The rules set forth what must be provided to the witness as part of uh, subpoenaing those people to to the table. Uh, and it's basically a set fee plus a mileage fee, so it's all dependent upon when, uh, where the person is relative to the location of the deposition. And it also depends on whether it's a non-party witness or whether it's a party witness. Does anybody uh, know what the rule is with respect to whether a witness fee is omitted from the service of the subpoena? Does that allow the witness simply not to show? No. Don says no. I agree. Uh, I think you should be prepared to tender the witness fee, and it'd be much better if you provided with the subpoena so you don't have anything to fight over, but the witness cannot fail to attend the deposition merely because they did not receive the witness fee. Nevertheless, it's sort of an embarrassing thing to leave out. So go ahead and make sure you get that witness fee served with the subpoena so that everything is uh, clearly done correctly and you don't end up with a witness on the phone saying I'm not coming because of uh, the witness fee not being included because that will embarrass you before all your co-counsel are in a meeting. Now, what if your witness is out of the state of Georgia? How do you use, under the Civil Practice Act, how do you get an out-of-state witness to this deposition table. And let's assume for the moment that this is not a witness who is cooperative with the other side. The other side cannot promise you that, that person will appear. Or alternatively, if they promise you that the witness will appear, you don't have any assurance that the uh, witness will bring the documents and other things that you want that witness to bring to the deposition. Does anybody know how you go about getting an out-of-state witness subpoenaed to a deposition for use in a trial that's pending in the state of Superior Courts of Georgia? Any ideas on that? you got to go to that state. you got to go to that court where the defendant or the witness resides. You've got to get a subpoena served in that court. Tell him to report to that court or someplace within that jurisdiction to appear for the deposition. Okay, Mr. Munger has given us an answer, and that answer is you have to use the powers of the foreign jurisdiction's courts to cause the witness to come to a place that's within the jurisdiction of that foreign court to come to the deposition. Do you have to have anything from Georgia courts to bring about the foreign court participating in this activity? Yeah. And what is that, Mr. Jones? I can't remember what it's called, but you have to go to your court and get them author to authorize the issuance of the subpoena that you wish to serve in the other jurisdiction. Okay, what I call that, and I believe I've seen it uniformly called as a commission, commission. to get a subpoena from an out, in order to subpoena an out-of-state witness. So basically, it's a request, could be in the form of a motion, uh, to the court in which your case is pending asking it to issue a commission to a foreign court to cause this witness in this foreign state to come to a deposition. 
and there, as is with any other motion, you probably need to have some factual basis and explanation to the court in your jurisdiction as to why this witness should have to appear and why this court in Georgia should trouble the court in, let's say, Pennsylvania or someplace to uh, cause this witness to appear. Mr. Carter, you have a question? We just got to be very, very careful about which state and which and that you're um, trying to do this in. Uh, we just had to do this in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, the, in, in Ohio, for example, all you need to do is send the commission to the clerk. The clerk commissions a subpoena from the, from the court of that county. In Pennsylvania, you actually have to file it's some sort of notice or action which amounts to an action in the court for it to be sub uh, uh, the subpoena to be issued um, by the judge. What you need to do in that case is make sure you get local counsel if you're not barred in Pennsylvania to make sure that you're not uh, unlicensed practice of law in Pennsylvania. So make sure that you look at, you know, call the clerks of the appropriate courts and make sure you comply with all their rules. And because they change even from county to county within the states, their, their requirements. Yes, I've done this in uh, Massachusetts, I think New York also. They usually call it a miscellaneous action. Mm -hmm. And usually you would utilize the services, for lack of a better description, of a court that is of a similar nature to the one you're uh, have the case pending in Georgia. So, for instance, a state or superior court, you typically would not go to the federal court in New York to try to get a subpoena issue. You, you would go by the rules of the local courts, uh, state courts in the foreign state. And as Mr. Carter has said, some of them will just sort of rubber stamp your request and issue a subpoena, usually upon the charging of a fee. So always call in advance, find out what the fee is. Or alternatively, they may actually actually make you start a lawsuit. And I think the only difference is you typically don't have to serve the lawsuit, for instance, on the defendant in your lawsuit. They're already served with the papers in the ordinary course of your uh, undertaking by way of you filing the, the request for the commission and all that for the deposition. But you would, of course, have to get the witness served in accordance with what laws? Laws of the forum state. Yeah, the laws of the forum state from which the subpoena yeah. is issued. So uh, it could be anything. It could be could require personal service. Could require personal service by a particular type of person. For instance, somebody over 18 years of age, not affiliated with the parties. Could require a special order of the court or it could be certified mail or, or FedEx. It depends on what the court from whom the subpoena, from which the subpoena is issuing requires. So basically, a lot of uh, T crossing and I dotting in order to get that witness to the table. Now, can you subpoena them from Pennsylvania to come down to Georgia for a deposition? No. No. Uh, unless they're really cooperative and then you never know what you can get. You don't know if they're gonna show up on your doorstep or not. On the day of the deposition, you know, might get sanctioned for having a no-show uh, witness. But for the most part, you're having to deal with whatever the rules are of that foreign court as to the jurisdiction, the geographical territory the court can deal with, and then you likely uh, would need to engage either a local counsel or borrow somebody's law office, or as Mr. Munger said, utilize some sort of room at the courthouse uh, to take this deposition. All right, now, one of the things I want to talk about today is all the logistics of dealing with a deposition. Uh, I'm actually pretty tired today, uh, and I'm tired on days that I take depositions, uh, but this time around, it's, I'm tired because I was up really late last night and up early this morning getting my son sent off on a uh, mission trip to Guatemala. And in this mission trip, he is uh, completing his Eagle Scout project, which is forming an, a library, children's library in Guatemala, in a town outside of Antigua, which is a modest-sized city in uh, Guatemala, and then the town is way up in the mountains. So what comes to mind is planning an de out-of-state deposition, particularly in a commercial case with a number of documents, is very similar to planning a mission trip in Guatemala. 
one thing is you're usually up late at night the night before preparing and you're usually up early the morning of the deposition getting all your ducks in a row. But logistically, they're very similar. Uh, so what if you're planning a big trip to a foreign country and you have to take a lot of stuff with you like library books, what do you have to do several months in advance? Ship them ahead. <laughs> well, you got to get them first, right? right. You got to get the books you're going to use. Well, in litigation, if it's a commercial litigation, you got to get the documents or the exhibits that you want to use in the deposition. You got to figure out what in the world you want to do with the deposition. Does anybody know how much a all an all day deposition costs? If you just have party, a witness, and the court reporter, just no videographer. No videographer. Does that include attorney's fees for preparation? What does it cost your client? If you're going to take a deposition in a commercial case, it's all day long. And you're the one taking the deposition. About fifteen hundred dollars. No, I think including it's preparation. Airfare. Nah, it's about believe it or not, it's about a thousand dollars just for the transcript. Yeah, that's what I would say. Just uh, it's more like three to five thousand dollars. Yeah. So if you talk about the preparation time uh, and the uh, paying the court reporters. Maybe having to rent a room somewhere if you're out of state or can't use your law office, can't borrow one, uh, you can end up being thousands of dollars uh, in a co complicated commercial case with lots and lots of uh, preparation trying to boil it down to a deposition that can be taken and when you get all the evidence you need given the limited amount of time you have to take the deposition. Spend a, you, know, you can spend four or five thousand dollars taking a deposition. Uh, so that's obviously not that dissimilar to a trip to Guatemala where you got a lot of investment and you don't want to get to Guatemala and not be prepared. So to prepare for a deposition, we've already talked about getting all the documents and such. Uh, what would you need to do with those documents prior to going to depose a key witness? Put them in the order that you're going to try to put them in the order that you're going to call them, mark them as exhibits, and make copies for everyone that's going to be there. You would need to have your, your documents ready to be used as exhibits in the deposition. Uh, but what if you don't know what the witness is going to testify and therefore you don't know exactly which documents you're going to have to use to cross-examine that witness? Well, you need, a, you need an index. You need a general index for a table of contents for yourself. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, as an example, I brought the <coughs> index of the books that are being used to form the library in Guatemala. Uh, but let's assume we've got a modestly priced commercial case where we're not going to use tremendous amount of technology to uh, prepare the case and attract the documents. Maybe several thousands of pages of documents uh, involved in this case. It's extremely helpful to do something electronically, at least minimum, maybe an Excel spreadsheet where you can review the documents and if you base label them, as we discussed, have every document where you got the base label, the dates, description of the document, and maybe notations with key words in it that you can use to find the document if you find your witness all of a sudden testifying about some subject matter that you know that person has touched on in emails or in other documents that you can use to uh, craft the testimony uh, that the witness is giving or cross-examine them if you know they're directly contradicted by the documents. So early on, maybe months in advance of actually taking a major deposition in a commercial case of an important witness, you know, prepare some sort of very organized set of document plan or index that it need be during the deposition. You can click in a few keywords on your um, on your computer and bring you directly to the document you need. And you know, with the email strings and everything, you can have one string of emails that covers 50 different topics. And what you need is really that one little paragraph and that one email that's on the fifth page of an email string. So, plan in advance. Utilizing who would you utilize to help you do this? Your paralegal. You'd use a lot of what are paralegals good for? I'm telling you. <laughs> Tell me about it. What would you do? 
I would collect all the documents that the client had given us to date. Sometimes that's not enough, but it's a good place to start. I'd put them in date order so that they tell the story, whatever story it is that we're trying to tell. Uh, I would take the pleadings into account depending on how far the litigation had gone. So if there was any facts or there was a pending summary judgment motion or something so that I would let him, uh, the attorney know what the statement of disputed issues were, et cetera. And you could use those pleadings for cross-examining the exactly, witnesses. Exactly, right, right. And um, I would make a notebook for the attorney to look at with a table of contents, an index, in Excel, like you're saying, and then let him decide what he thinks this witness is gonna be best to testify. Again, it depends on how many documents are involved. A modest case is what we're talking about. We're talking about a gigantic case, we would, might approach it differently because it would become document intensive. Mm -hmm. Now one thing you can do with an Excel spreadsheet is you can put the dates of the documents in, the to and from or whatever. You can also rank your documents as to the perceived value of them to the case and how important and relevant they are. Uh, and you can, you'll also have the Bates numbers on the, on the same documents in the same row of the spreadsheet. So for instance, let's say you get the documents huge hodgepodge, they're completely out of date order. And the only way to go through them is basically starting with base number one and go through because you have no idea what order they're in. As long as you put them in your spreadsheet, you can then sort your spreadsheet by date order and all of a sudden, if you've made, it tells some, the story. You've made some notes, all of a sudden the story appears. You can see the back and forth between the people. You can see how the contract came into formation or uh, how the secretive uh, plot unfolded or who it was that was involved that had knowledge of a certain fact and how their, their, <coughs> the knowledge they had necessarily impacted on what other people are saying. Uh, and so you can utilize the electronics to help that. Another thing you can do to help sort out all the documents that aren't particularly important, if you rank them, let's say you rank them one to five on, a, on an importance, you can sort it, after you sort it by date, you can sort it by importance and all of a sudden you get rid of all, all the bad documents, the ones that are just about people setting up ones, end up at the bottom of the, the spreadsheet and all the ones that relate to the cause of action end up at the top in date order. And you can watch the to and from and figure out what, what in the world these people were doing that, that gave rise to this uh, cause of action. So you would start planning in advance to do this because by the time you show up with a couple of boxes of documents at your deposition in California, uh, you're pretty much going to be stuck with uh, what you got there to work with. Now, as mentioned, sort of like going to Guatemala. Boy, didn't know what I'm talking about Guatemala. But uh, <laughs> sort of like going to Guatemala, you got to figure out how to get all this stuff out to California to utilize it in, in the deposition. And of course, these days, you theoretically could have it all on computers so long as you got friendly IT people there uh, to get things printed out uh, jiffy quick if you needed them in the middle of a deposition. Uh, or you can take them organized. I prefer Bates label, uh, Bates number order, so that when I look at my spreadsheet, all I have to do is go to Bates number, and it doesn't matter what the date is or who wrote it or anything else. That document is going to be the document that's on my chart. Uh, so you can, no matter what that witness says, if you know what the documents say and, and you know that you've got key words and you find that document that touches on that subject matter that the witness is trying to fool you about or whatever, uh, boom, you can pull the document out, cross-examine them on it within seconds while you're sitting there in the deposition room, even if you're there by yourself. Obviously, uh, who is it very helpful to have around if you've got a really complicated case with lots of documents? Your paralegal. Your paralegal, yeah. If, you can, if your client can afford it, uh, somebody who's there who can feed you, who knows the case well, who can feed you the uh, necessary cross-examination materials uh, on a real-time basis while you've got this witness hot and heavy in a conversation and while you've got them sort of locked down, they can't get out of their, their thought stream because you just keep pounding them uh, with the documents they've already written. Uh, that's a very, very nice luxury to have, similar to court. Uh, okay, uh, so obviously you don't want to just go ask 
a bunch of questions about a lot of documents at some extremely high rate of expenditure by your client, what would you want to do weeks, in, and I'm talking about a couple of weeks in advance at least, of the deposition that you're going to, the big deposition you're going to take out of state? Prepare an outline. What would you want your outline to cover? Uh, background information on the witness. Typically you do that first of all, and then you get into questions about the key documents. And if you're a defendant, you want to probe the witness's testimony that would deal with your defenses um, to the claims, and if you're the plaintiff, uh, the reverse. Okay, so if, uh, if, you're, if you're setting it up, the witness, to you know, find their testimony on these subject matters, what kind of testimony do you want to get about the subject matter? Let's say you're the defendant. What sort of testimony do you want to get from the witness? If you're the defendant. He made you do it. <laughs> He's the big guy. You want to get testimony that will help you win the case, right? right? <laughs> And so, so sometimes if you had your documents well organized, you figured out what was going on in these folks' heads, uh, and you can utilize what has previously been said in pleadings, in interrogatory responses, in written documentation, you can cause, for like, I mean, you can't actually cause, but you can bring about the witness testifying favorably to your subject matter if you have a plan of how to go about doing that. Now, Mr. Jones has brought up some very important things, and usually you do. You spend time familiarizing yourself with the witness as a person. You get their background, find out what they're interested in, what their educational level is, what their knowledge is of the subject matter, you know, what the positions are with the company that they've had, who they deal with, who they report to. Uh, if it's a worry, you're worried about uh, jury selection, who they might have in the geographical region that would be a potential grounds for striking them, a, 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 a juror as a, a, a potential juror as a juror. Uh, one thing I find that's helpful is to find out what their grounding is, for lack of a better description. What, what sort of things make the witness tick? What are their interests? Uh, I'll give you an example. In a recent deposition, I, and sort of the background thing, I was trying to find out who might be closely associated with this particular key witness <coughs> in the county where the lawsuit was pending, so that if I had a juror that met any of those criteria, I could consider striking that juror from the jury. Uh, and I found out that the witness was in a fraternity at Kennesaw State University. And it happened to be the same fraternity that I was in in college. And I happened to know First of all, you can assume that most fraternities, sororities have lofty uh, aspirational uh, tenets that they go by, they supposedly go by. And uh, in this particular fraternity, it was love, truth, and honor. Well, I knew that. So once I found out he was in the fraternity, when he started waffling on testimony, you know, four hours, five hours down, in the deposition, I asked him, so what are the tenets of the Sigma Nu fraternity? Which are love, truth, and honor. And that all of a sudden sort of made him straighten up and uh, testify right. <laughs> for lack of a better description. And, and you, can, you can certainly do the same thing with uh, somebody who's overtly, you know, wearing their religion on their sleeve or whatever. Uh, if you find out they've real, they're sort of in a testifying and they know they've been told to testify this way by their lawyer, which of course wouldn't be correct, but nevertheless it happens, and yet you want to get the actual truth that you know that they have within them uh, uh, to, test, to come out in the testimony, uh, you can use that background information as you go along to uh, assist in your deposition. Also, you know, if, for instance, if they have an engineering degree, uh, that they've testified about as part of their background, that there's certain things they're not going to be able to deny, and they have to know unless they just claim to be complete idiots uh, as a result of getting their engineering degree. And that has helped along the way. I mean, I've had situations where I actually established certain facts 
and then I got the witness to confirm a particular tr trigonomic function or formula, and then I just slapped the, the, the uh, calculator in front of him and said, well, calculate what this has to be, and it totally contradicted the whole defense of the, of the defendant. You know, they claimed that they had laid asphalt at a particular angle, but once I established the physical facts of the material put on the track and the triangle that it made, he couldn't deny that if it, if it created this, <coughs> this particular triangular, the, 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 the angle had to be much steeper than what they had uh, stated it was. So all that background information can be very helpful and you need to use it to your advantage. Okay, so you've gotten there with your stuff, with your organized documents, your index, your outline. You know what you would love to get from this witness. Uh, there are several other things I'd love to throw in there as suggestions to take to a deposition. And there was a guy I had a recent case with who had it all in one little package. I was very impressed. He says he takes it to every deposition. Uh, and that is a package of things that he uses at every or wants to have available at every deposition. And that would include pens, paper, uh, but it would also include uh, paper clips, a little stapler, in case you end up with having to connect pages that the witnesses says, oh, this, this, this letter really had this as an enclosure. It wasn't really that because it was just produced wrong. You could then take the deposit, take the things and staple it together and say, okay, we've now stapled together the entirety of the letter you sent to so-and-so. Uh, but most importantly, uh, and something that I only learned through experience is taking medical supplies, which were also taken to Guatemala. Uh, when we were packing at 1 a.m. this morning, medical supplies to take to Guatemala. What kind of medical supplies do you need to take to a deposition? <laughs> what kind would you take, Ron? I don't know if they could take any medical supplies. Ron would drive his truck to the deposition and not his motorcycle, so he'd have to take fewer medical supplies. Well, one thing is definitely take band-aids. What can happen in a deposition that you would need band-aids for? Paper cuts. And how nice is it? For, you to, for your fingers to be spewing blood while you're taking a deposition. It's not nice. It's not, not nice at all. So you might you definitely ought to take band-aids. You might want to take Bactine or something if you're really worried about uh, that type of thing. But you might want to take some highlighters and things like that. But one thing that I, and what else, what other kind of medical thing can come up in a really hard deposition? Headache. A headache. So what would you need for that? Your favorite pain reliever, uh, and that can make oh, it can make a huge difference if you happen to have some aspirin or some uh, whatever your favorite pain reliever is, uh, because taking a deposition with a pounding headache when you're trying to listen to every single nuance of the person's answer can be pretty bad. So once you get there. Uh, you're ready to go. So why are you going to, how are you going to answer, ask these questions? Well, first of all, you're going to have an outline, right, Mr. Jones? Right. And that outline is going to, you're going to cover the general background information on this person. You're going to find out whether they are uh, ready to take the deposition. Deborah, what, would, what kind of problem might come up in a deposition if you show up uh, and you find out something about the witness you didn't anticipate? You got any examples on that? You don't have to use names. Oh. Uh, yeah, I actually have many examples on that. Um, in the entertainment practice in uh, Southern California, clients frequently want to come to the depositions to see the, uh, the deponent uh, tell the truth, which is, first of all, going to be very hard. So you have a client sitting there, a high-profile client, who insists that his bodyguards be present. You have a high-profile client, a deponent, and just his bodyguards be present. And before you know it, you have a brawl and not a depo. <laughs> so, uh, and as a paralegal who's supposed to be sort of gray in color or neutral, we sit back with our documents. You just look at your boss and say, you know, do I have your back or do you got my back or what are we going to do here? 
Um, so planning to keep your client away from a deposition is a very good idea. I don't think regular folks uh, think about asking their lawyer if they can come to a deposition, but to the entertainment business, the whole world is a stage, so they're, they, they just continue on. Okay, now that's, that's one subject matter, and it's certainly one we'll take up, which is what happens if a fight breaks out or in the deposition, or if you have some circumstance where the witness is getting abused which we'll cover later. Uh, well, does anybody have any grounds, for, any, any thoughts about how you would determine whether a witness is even competent to be testifying or whether you want to evaluate whether they're competent to be testifying? You can sustain a question if they are taking any medication that prevents them from uh, answering you know, truthfully or accurately during the deposition. Right. And, and, uh, along the same lines, anything that would prevent them from having good memory. If they know of something that's deterring them from having good memory. What are you trying to do in partner deposition? You're trying to blank the door on changes to their testimony. What's the blank? Close. Close the door on changes to their testimony down the road. Once you get it, you want to be able to rely on that testimony and not have them come back and say, oh, I was really, you know, in my mind I was visiting my dead aunt or something and, and I was thinking about something completely different. Now uh, the other thing is you know these days anything can happen. What, ha what do you do if the witness uh, shows up and the person is drunk as a skunk? Do you go ahead and depose them? I did. <laughs> With my client. <laughs> you deposed your own client? Well I let the deposition go on. I made him sit at the other end of the table and he was, he went, we broke at lunch and he came back, he was so drunk he couldn't get up the stairs. <laughs> Alright, so in that instance it's the non-witness that's the drunk one, right? No, you can't but, propose a drunk witness, you've got to stop the deposition. Uh, well, uh, for sure you don't have to. Uh, but if they call it an accident because they're an alcoholic, you may want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might want to have them just, uh, you know, tell the truth, so to speak. What were you doing? What were you doing five minutes ago? What were you doing right before the rip? Uh, well, you also want to make sure under Rule 91132 uh, D that if you have some grounds to challenge the competency of the witness uh, to testify, and you believe you need to assert that, as opposed to, in other words, to the benefit of your client to make the appropriate objection, you would need to object uh, as to any error or irregularity that might uh, go to the competency of the witness. Uh, so that, uh, particularly if it's your own witness, let's say it's a third party witness of a car wreck and the person shows up completely drunk and you have, you've interviewed them when they were sober but you have no idea what they're gonna say, you better, you better object to the competency of the witness and set forth in the deposition transcript all the grounds why you think this person is not ready to testify that particular day. Yes, Tom? Uh, it just reminds me, it's a good, always a good idea to bring the rules with you. So, yeah, because when in doubt. Yeah, when in doubt, check the rules. <laughs> right. Uh, because yeah, you, you could really end up stumbling if you if the judge if the other side says, well, let's get the judge on the line, and you can't cite a single rule to the judge. All you can say is, I know it's in there somewhere, Your Honor. <laughs> uh, it's not particularly impressive over the phone when you've got the judge on the line. Okay, uh, so. Uh, you find out whether the person at least believes they are prepared to give testimony in the case, and the court reporter, of course, will then do what uh, at the beginning of the deposition, or will do is what at the beginning of the deposition? Swear on the, the witness. witness. Don't forget it. Most court reporters will remind you. Some don't, or they forget to remind you. Uh, and so it certainly happened that a deposition has gone all the way through. Nobody ever swore the witness. It makes it sort of a waste. Who has to be in a deposition being taken in Georgia under the Civil Practice Act? Other than the witness. <laughs> a court reporter. A court reporter doing what? <clears throat> Making a stenographic record. Uh, and as far as I know, there are only two types of stenographic records. You got the the machine where they take it down like this, and then you have the, the mask that they talk into. All right, let's assume you're there, you got your court reporter taking a stenographic record. Uh, 
can you record it some other way as well? With videotape. Yeah. Yeah, you can videotape it. You could audio tape it. You can audio tape it. The rule just says as long as you have a stenographic recorder, you may record it basically any other way you want to, so long as you cover the cost of, of having it recorded that way. So is there any rule against uh, you just setting up a video camera like I have right here and videotaping the witness testifying? It used to be you had to get an order in advance to do that, but I don't think that's applies anymore. That's right. They, they amended the rule. <laughs> which is 9-11-30, uh, that just uh, does not say, well, first of all, you don't have to get an order like you used to. You used to, have, you used to have real defined, very strict rules, like it would say only the head and shoulders of the witness can be in the frame of the camera, blah, blah, blah. Now it just says 9-11-30-B-4, uh, 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 recording of the deposition, you can record any way you want to. I think you have to state in your notes, yeah. though. You can't, you can't just say you're going to just do it conventionally and then just show up with all this video equipment. I think you have to state in the notice the method that you're going to use. You can mm -hmm. use more than one method. Yeah, I actually do put that. I usually just put in the end this may be video recorded in my deposition notices so I don't just forget to have it in there if I decide I wanted to, po uh, to post just it. Just do it standard, maybe mm -hmm. may be recorded by the video. Right. That way the other side does have notice. Whether it has to be in there, I don't know. Whether it has to be in the notice. I know that if, if, if you, I've gone through, I know we've gone from the order, and then there was a period of time for sure where it had to be in the notice, and then you've got this maybe language in the, the rule, which doesn't necessarily say, it doesn't say so long as you gave notice in advance, it just says so long as you pay for it. So. In any event, there are lots of reasons for uh, video <coughs> depositions, uh, and it's also lots of reasons to give notice to your opponent so they don't object. Uh, I've had one circumstance where uh, I showed up with a video camera. It was a high-profile witness. I had noticed the video uh, video deposition, but it was but I didn't. My client was out of money, completely out of money. I didn't want to pay a thousand, another thousand dollars for the videographer to be there. And uh, the other side objected to the use of the video deposition, called their friendly, this is an outlying county, called their friendly judge. The judge said it can't be video recorded. Uh, and so we went ahead and did the deposition without the video videographer. But, you know, what's your solution when the court rules you can't videotape it? You know, there's really not much solution other than going ahead and taking a normal deposition. And, uh, you know, I wish I had videotaped it because the guy was such a fumbler, you know, that it would have been, uh, what, he came out a lot better on the transcript than he did, would have, uh, in person. Uh, okay, asking the questions. Do you just start with, you know, the day the contract was signed and march straight through chronologically all your questions? No. No, you don't do that. You could. Uh, do you have to have all testimony on one subject matter in one segment of your deposition? No. No, you don't. No, you don't. Do you have to start at the beginning of, of uh, the relationship between the parties at all? No. You, in fact, can take the deposition completely backwards, sort of like eating dessert first. Uh, if you have an email or a letter written by the opposing side or that particular witness, particularly would be good, that capsulizes everything you want to prove as part of your deposition, you can get them to commit, let's hopefully it's been signed or sent by that person. You know, you can get them to commit to the contents of that letter or whatever and then work backwards from there even if that was the last thing that was ever done. Uh, I call it just taking the deposition backwards or, or uh, you know, making sure that your principal uh, facts are established. And if it's a deposition, I mean a discovery deposition, well then you go, uh, after that you go and find all the stuff out that you just want, the, sort of the, you would like to know information as opposed to, uh, you want to make sure you nail down the facts that you have to have out of this deposition. 
And sometimes once you get them to commit to that, no matter what, what else they say, becomes irrelevant. It's all just gibberish, sort of dicta. I wish I had done that. I would have liked to have done that. I wish I could remember that. Uh, and you know, recently I had some depositions where nobody would testify to anything unless I showed them an email saying they had done it, uh, which comes across as extremely uh, not very believable. I guess I'll put it that way. Uh, but you have to utilize those written records of what happened. Uh, and you can go by line by line, inch by inch in the, uh, in the uh, written record and get them to agree you wouldn't have put that word in there if you didn't actually see the thing. Or, uh, we've got one right now where you know, a guy says he's never texted in his life, but the emails show that he was texting back and forth. Uh, so also, you need to look very, very carefully at the verb tenses and everything utilized, particularly by uh, educated people in their correspondence. Uh, I had a deposition where we were trying to prove that something had happened in a closed door meeting between my singular <coughs> client representative and a whole group of people from the other side of the dispute. Everybody on the other side of the dispute that was in the, in the meeting said one thing happened. My guy said something entirely different happened. Basically, my guy said they terminated our contract. The other side said they didn't, they didn't know such thing. Well, what happened is we found some emails of people that were not in the meeting, but that knew the meeting was going to take place. And one of the women was communicating with our project manager. And immediately after the meeting was over, she called the project manager on our side. And then she immediately sent an email to a colleague who was not in the meeting at this opposing party. And the email said, she, referring to our project manager, was not as surprised as we had thought she would be. Uh, and the topic of her discussion between uh, my project manager and her was the fact that the contract had been terminated. So the thing she was not surprised about was the termination. Uh, but the fact that she said, as we had thought she would be, I was able to establish that they knew in advance, these two outside project managers knew in advance, the termination would actually happen in the immediately preceding board meeting with my client. And uh, when I got the woman to that point as a videotape deposition, she just looked sort of plaintively into the camera <coughs> saying, that's, you know, that's what it means. <laughs> Even though obviously I think she had been coached not to testify to that, not to say that's what had happened. Uh, so, you got to watch carefully, and you can get people, you know, using extreme detail to rely upon or the actual verb tenses in their communications. Uh, okay. Uh, so your deposition is started. You've sworn the witness and uh, you go about getting your testimony forwards, backwards, general, specific, whatever it may be. Uh, what if the other side just starts objecting to every single thing that you ask and essentially giving the witness the answer to every question? Uh, you know, I ask, so what is your name? And the person says, you should, I object, you shouldn't be asking them what their name is. They just testified to that. There's been no testimony about the fact that she got divorced. Uh, you know, the person who she was divorced from, yes, he was a drug addict, but no, she was, had no involvement in that. Uh, or some crazy, uh, you know, response like that. And it happens over and over again during the course of the deposition. Do you have any remedies? Sure. What would be a remedy? Well, ultimately you call the judge, but before you do that, you say the rules provide that you can say objection. <clears throat> all objections are being reserved to later. All you have to do is say objection and it's preserved. Speaking of objections are improper. You're coaching the witness. If you keep doing it, I'm going to call the judge and get directions from the judge. Okay, that's... And, and hopefully that'll work. Hopefully it'll put down, put down the opposing. It's amazing line. how much videotape helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but yeah, if you just can't reach videos. the judge, then you shut down the depot? Yeah, that's your alternative. That's isn't? plan B, right? Yeah, but you have to move immediately for a protective order if you're going to shut down the depot. You can't just shut it down right. and let the other side, uh, you know, do it. You've got to move for an order. Motion to compel. And what role would that be under, Mr. Munger? Oh, goodness. Um, when in doubt. Under 26, and. Well, I'm looking at uh, 9-11-30-D, motion to terminate or limit examination. Uh, that certainly covers uh, part of it. Uh, that would be potentially uh, prior to the deposition. And then uh, there's also a portion relating to get, which I was going to get to shortly, regarding uh, the abusive deposition taker, uh, the person who's taking the deposition. There's some pretty good case law. Business. There's some pretty good case law on the speaking objection business. Um, and you know, I don't have any sites to them off the top of my head, but the, there are a number of cases where judges have dealt with situations where somebody defending a deposition has been clearly trying to telegraph answers to the witness. The court said that was entirely improper. So you've got, and you got some ethical issues associated with that as well. If the, essentially it's sort of in, in the room witness tampering in a sense, or could be reviewed that way by the judge. Now, if, if you stipulate at the beginning of a deposition that all objections except for as to the form of the question and the responsiveness of the answer to the question are reserved until the use of the deposition, does that mean that the only thing you can say is object to the form or object to the responsiveness of the answer? I think the only thing it technically means is objection. You can say object to the form or object to responsiveness. The purpose of that is to allow the deposition taker to rephrase the question so that it's non-objectionable um, or you know, um, perhaps to put on the record that you don't think the witness has responded to the question, but you know, it's it, it, it's it's not permissible to get substantive in your objections. So, you, in, in essence, you can coach the witness on what they should say or not say. Okay, can you say? Let's say that the uh, witness is testifying along, and they say something happened in 2010. And then, you know, a few minutes later, the uh, questioner says, so as you testified in 2012, you did this. Uh, how did you, you know, why did, why did you do that then? Uh, can you object to something along the lines of objection? There's been no testimony at all about this subject matter in 2012? Yeah, or it misstates the testimony. I'm sure you can. I, yeah. I believe so, too. Yeah. That... You're, you're reserving the objection, so all you have to make is the objection to the form or the objection to the responsiveness of the answer to the question. Many questioners will try to sell you, tell you you agreed to that so you can't say anything else. Well, I believe that there's some, between the coaching the witness and uh, only objecting to the form and objecting to the responsiveness of the answer to the question, there are obviously some mechanisms you can use to object that would be for the purpose of keeping the record straight and not causing chaos within the record. Or, or alternatively, if your witness is completely in a different realm, you know, a whole different year, and somehow or another they've got the questioner has gotten them on this track and they keep testifying about the wrong year, uh, you can certainly object to every single answer as a, you know, objection to the responsiveness of the answer to the question. Even though the person literally be responding to the question, it would be obvious that they were talking about the entirely wrong year. All right, now, as the questioner, can you lean over the table and pound your fist and make threats to the witness? Absolutely. No. No, you can't. But that happens all the time on TV. <laughs> well, why can't you? 
Well, if the lawyer lets you get away with it, sure you can. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, there's a difference between what you can do and what you can legally do or what you can get, might get stopped from doing, right? Uh, so uh, if, if you have a situation where you're defending a deposition and somebody's doing that to your witness, let's say that they're belittling the witness, constantly calling the person by some insinuating incorrect last name, uh, you know, or some, some other way, uh, really badgering your witness in an inappropriate fashion, what can you do? Well, I, I, think, record. Yeah, I think you not only can you object, but you can even um, either say you're going off the record or request to go off the record and have an off the record conversation with a lawyer. A lot depends on personalities involved and what, you know, who's going on. But as far as being on the record is concerned, I think you can object and say that, uh, that the questions are intimidating or badgering the witness. And, and you object to the form. Uh, if it continues, you're going to uh, instruct the witness not to answer. You're going to terminate the deposition. You're going to call the judge. I mean, a lot of different things you can do. OK, so it's sort of a building thing if you're defending this deposition. You've got an abusive questioner. Uh, but you ultimately can, if the, uh, if the deposition ask asker is being oppressive, annoying, or embarrassing, uh, the witness, uh, I mean, obviously, if the witness just has testimony that's embarrassing to give, that's not the grounds for stopping the deposition. But if the questioner is doing nothing other than trying to harass the witness and annoy the witness, uh, you can seek uh, from the court, if you can get a hold of the judge, you can seek an immediate uh, order terminating the deposition or ordering the opposing party to stop it or you can say we're picking up the deposition we're taking it down to the courthouse to sit in the jury room next to the judge and have this deposition continue so the jury can I mean the judge can come in and control the deposition uh, if need be now what if you can't get the judge well, I think you can terminate the deposition and walk out and you do it at your own risk I think if it, yeah, if you get to the point where you've made a big record and you're pretty darn sure that the, the record is going to establish that this witness is really badly being abused and you can't get the judge on the line after maybe several attempts, you can make a record that you try to get everybody to agree. We tried to get the judge. We couldn't. We're not going to let this continue on. Most judges would honor that effort by, by, the, by the lawyer and not penalize you. Yeah, the, ri the risk is that that the judge looks at it after the fact and doesn't think that your witness is being intimidated or harassed enough to terminate the deposition mm -hmm. and somehow take some sanction against you to either charge your costs or, I mean, they're going to order you to continue the deposition, may admonish the other party not to ask the questions that way, but there may be some costs assessed for terminating and and having to do it all over again or come back and do it. Right, it's highly into the discretion of the judge, but right. somewhere along the way, at, at the end of the day, you got to do what you think is right. Uh, <coughs> and it may, may cost you something. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, there are client issues, too, I think, that can play into this. I mean, if, you're, if, if the witness is your client, as opposed to being like a friendly witness or employee of your client, or a low-level employee of your client, you may you may also have that dynamic where you know a lot of witnesses expect you to be there to protect them, you know, which which you really are. But you know, I always tell witnesses when I'm prepping them for a depot that I'm there to object, but I'm not there to answer for you, and I'm not there to you know. You essentially have to protect yourself as long as the guy, as long as the lawyer on the other side is is being professional. Um, so the. At some point, you know, the witness is going to look like, hey, why aren't you sticking up for me? You know, and so you have to sort of, this is what you have to gauge. I think you have to gauge at what point does the guy be abusive? What is my client or my client's employee? How is, how is that person reacting to all this? Now, what about this? What if you had uh, something happen during a deposition? Maybe it's just somebody needs to go to the restroom. So you take a break and you go out and you take your witness 
and you tell them everything that they missed testifying about in the first part of the deposition, everything they need to make sure they testified about in the second part of the deposition. Uh, and let's say it's your client, your client. Uh, what can be done by the other side with respect to that testimony? They can ask you about it. They can ask you if you had any conversations, including with your counsel, about the subject matter of the deposition of the lawsuit, and you could possibly be compelled to have it disclosed. Even You're not though supposed to confer like that mm -hmm. during the deposition. Okay, so obviously the, wit the questioner you're saying when the, when they come back in they can say well I saw you out there in the hallway talking to your lawyer what did he say to you and of course the lawyer is likely to object and say what uh, and then you would have to argue out whether or not they inappropriately talked to the witness in the midst of an examination <coughs> by the opposing party uh, now, this would be especially true in what kind of deposition? Uh, deposition for preservation of evidence. A uh, deposition for preservation of evidence. If this testimony was actually going to be the testimony that was going to happen at trial, I think a court would very, be very sensitive to a break in the middle of the testimony at the request of the witness to go to the bathroom and then having the witness get a bunch of coaching. <coughs> while in the restroom or in the break from the lawyer who uh, is defending that way. Well, there's a distinction between eliciting that there was conversation on the subject matter of the testimony and what was actually said and not said. Yes. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that you could make a valid attorney-client privilege objection to the question, did you talk about the testimony? Yeah. Either yeah. that which you have already given or that which you expect to give. I, I, I don't I don't think that question in and of itself is covered by the attorney client privilege. Especially if somebody saw you talking right there. Sure. Well, but what about you, if you said, think, well, I, what, what you is your lawyer saying? Whether you saw him or didn't, you, I think you're entitled yeah, to ask that question you, after any break. They go to lunch and right. rework right. the whole case. You can ask them if they discuss the case when they were. Yeah, sure. How many people that are in this room that take depositions have asked that question? after a break. I have. Yeah. So I have to. Uh, how many have had, had it asked of their witness? I have. <laughs> <laughs> and how does the witness answer? <laughs> the witnesses sometimes, and that really puts you in a bind as an attorney because... Yeah, you got to uh, tell your witness you can't talk. Witness, uh, witness answers, uh, yes, we did talk about the case and my attorney reiterated the admonition that I should tell the truth on everything. <laughs> 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 That's what the good witness will say in part. Henry. But sometimes they'll say, oh, we didn't talk at all. All we talked about was uh, the know, weather, hot dogs, and apple pie and mom. I had a, I had a case once where um, it was very contentious, and it was in the afternoon of this deposition that we were out talking, and as soon as we got in, the lawyer said, all right, you were talking, you're talking to Mr. Boyle. What did you all talk about? And the witness looked at me like he was not sure what to say. I said, so go ahead and say it. He said, uh, we we're talking about what a jerk you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, you know, that's the rest the guy takes. Well, uh, just be aware, Jeff. What about an expert or other fact witnesses that aren't your client? Well, an expert's uh, bias can be broadly examined on. So if there's something that gave rise to a bias during that conversation, I would say it would be extremely risky. For the, for the conversation to take place mid-deposition. And I think at the end of the day, a court is going to want everything to be known about what influenced an expert's testimony. So privilege may not extend. Well, certainly not. And it's definitely not attorney-client privilege. Generally, a testifying court. expert, uh, you, can, you have to disclose conversations you have with them, and written communications, and to see if you just we're engaging any kind of way to try to shape their testimony and their conclusions. Yeah, you gotta, you got to put all that on the table. And I've seen testifying experts arrive with their own attorney. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the counsel yeah. for the case, mm -hmm. for the plaintiff and defendant are there, but here comes the expert, surprisingly, with his own counsel. 
obviously very high profile cases, but that will throw a loop into a death out. Henry, who's had it who's ever taken a deposition where the opposing counsel and you were deposing several witnesses at one time, when each witness came in, he claimed that that witness was his client for purposes of the deposition. And then that witness could not disclose any conversations that they had with that attorney to prepare that witness. And as soon as they were done testifying, he dissolved the attorney-client relationship. Has anybody ever had that happen? I've never had that happen. Don, you have? Well, yeah, the lawyer I, that I've learned uh, that I, I guess grew up working for for my first seven years, he used to do that. And I was never comfortable with it, but that was his practice. He would, I have a case if, we had a, if we had a friendly third-party witness, we would meet with him ahead of time, and he would say, look, I'm going to be your lawyer for purposes of the depo, and he would use that to shroud the whole prep session. I yeah, think you get into all doing. sorts of uh, <laughs> uh, issues, ethical issues, <laughs> complex issues regarding that. I've got uh, a case on that, and, and that's exactly what happened. And the judge said uh, that it was a, a complete conflict and uh, kicked the attorney off the case, mm -hmm. fired the attorney. Uh, there was a case recently before Judge Grubbs in Cobb County where there were communications through a general counsel of a hospital where uh, the defense lawyers, well, she, can, she found the defense lawyers were trying to get the general counsel of another hospital to prevent a, a witness, doctor witness who was favorable from the plaintiff to testify. And she disqualified the defense counsel, the entire firm, uh, saying, you know, basically you're causing the witness to be uh, impacted by this general counsel, this triangular mechanism, trying to get the person not to testify for the plaintiff, uh, apparently under threat of you know being terminated from employment or whatever in the hospital. Well, if you're the so, if you're the defending attorney, then what is the best way through that if it's not? I'm representing you for purposes of judgment. Should you get something in writing from your client and the, the defendant that says, you know, you're waiving any potential conflicts and your interests are aligned, therefore there's really no conflict or something like that? If you're representing witnesses that are employed by your client or no, no, just third non-party witness? Yeah, it had to be a third party or someone else that, in the example given, you're, you're really representing them just to defend them for the deposition, but you want all that prep time to remain Privilege. I'm not sure you can do it. I don't well, think you can get away with it because that would be <clears throat> essentially if the witness had anything that testified that wasn't good for your case, you could be in a real fix uh, for witness tampering or something. Yeah. Um, but other times you, I mean, what often I often have happen is there's a third party witness who's willing to talk to me, and I know the other side's going to depose him, and he's willing to talk to me before the deposition in an interview. And you do that, but you just have to be aware. You just sort of have to pretend that the opposing counsel is sitting there mm -hmm. listening to everything. Because yeah. potentially they could find it all out. So you have to be careful not to share your strategy about the case, right. confidential things from the client with this witness. But you want to find out what the witness knows. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, maybe go ahead and throw in there and just say, hey, we're just meeting. You know, you're here on your own and, and all that. Yeah. So that then when he talks him. about it later, did you ever meet with Boyle before the depot? You can just say, yeah, I met with him, I've, tell, I've told him everything I'm telling you now. And, mm -hmm. and it often comes up when you have, you're representing a company and a key witness is no longer at the company. Mm -hmm. right. All their testimony is about the time when they were with, at the company. Mm -hmm. so, so their interests are aligned. Yeah. Possibly. Well, it depends on what the prior employee did. Yeah. Well, there's nothing so, to prevent the Michael, company is. from hiring an attorney for that person. You know, that, that happens a lot of times in medical, medical malpractice cases. <coughs> you got nurses and doctors mm -hmm. and everything, and some of them have testimony that's not helpful at all for the, for the hospital. And I, I just don't think you can say, well, I represent all of them. You know, they all work here, and I represent all of them. I, I just don't think you can do that. Okay, you know, where, where I thought you were going with that, and then we're going to need to conclude, is uh, <coughs> the, the, the uh, corporate representative constantly rolling during the course of the, you know, in the first deposition, the CEO is the corporate representative for the, for the uh, vice president. And then in the next deposition, the vice president is the corporate representative for the sales rep. And uh, I, I don't know the resolution to the answer or whether for, her, for a specific deposition, whether they can constantly change 
the corporate representative so as to allow the next witness in line to hear the testimony of the preceding no, no, witness. No, I don't think he can do that. No. Uh, what is the grounds for? Is, does a company have to appoint one corporate representative for the entire well, I, case? I think if it discovery? becomes an issue, I, I, I don't know the case law, but this, my gut tells me is it becomes an issue, take it up with the judge. The judge is going to let them designate one corporate representative who will be able to sit there and listen and may not have to be deposed until after they've heard everybody else. But they only get one bite at that apple. They can't keep it, keep coming back with it. Otherwise, it defeats the sequestration rule. Yeah, it, it just defeats exactly. the rule. Except when we're talking about discovery, for the most part, not preservation of evidence. So I, 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 yeah. I would like to see if, any, if we have any case law on that. That would be good, good to know yeah. because you're always, remember, you're always up against, okay, if I call this deposition, we can't get the judge. You know, how much is it going to take to get it rearranged? How much do I have to review to re get prepared for the deposition again? Does it really matter whether this person hears the testimony of this person? Yeah. Uh, and and, and if, if it's not a big deal, you know, the cost-benefit of that analysis might switch towards, well, let's just go ahead and do it. If it's a huge deal, if it's the nurse listening to what the doctor said happened in the emergency room, and the nurse has been appointed by the hospital as the corporate representative, right. Uh, that might be a huge thing because the nurse is going to be very hesitant to come in and say, oh, that doctor completely lied about everything he said in his deposition. Whereas if she doesn't know what he said in the deposition, he or she, then the witness would be more able to freely testify. So I guess we've had a very active uh, time and with a little luck. The mission trip is in Guatemala with all the books. We have one more question. I just think it might be helpful to note that we talked earlier about how you subpoena a witness out of state, and that only is for state court cases. It's a lot, yeah. it's a much different procedure yes. and simpler in federal court. Much more streamlined. Much more streamlined. And in federal court, basically, if you are admitted in the court where the case is pending, you can issue a subpoena from the distant federal court on your own signature to cause the witness to come to the deposition. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, so thank you very much. Remember, this is not legal advice, but please join us next month for more on depositions. <laughs>